and we are happy to have the two events from Tsinghua University. It's very happy for me to come back to Chicago uh, and give a talk and uh, meeting all these uh, professors I introduced to you today. And uh, yeah, so this talk will be on my defining an ancient power operator in 1953 using high which I find to be uh, something very exciting. Um, so the the problem of uh, defining instant power energy operator in that TV is sort of a long standing problem in the field. Uh, it was first uh, posed by uh, Sam, Samsung as well as uh, his friend Richard Sassanoff to me. And then at that place, occasion, I heard about the same problem from David Kaplan at the uh, University of Washington, Seattle. Um, so uh, it's a uh, very interesting in the in the field of statistics, but it turns out that uh, the resolution uh, requires some uh, formal mathematical thinking uh, that comes from high category theory, uh, where the influence comes from the studies on uh, psychological factors. Uh, yeah. So um, the paper has not been written up yet, but I hope to uh, submit it uh, during the summer. So the talk will be organized as the following. Um, for the first about 20 or so minutes, I'll give an overview uh, what the problem is, what's the origin of the why, why, why there is such a problem, and uh, what are our vague ideas towards the solution and some how it goes. That uh, after this overview, I'll go into more detail, talking about uh, some known lattice models first with topological operators. Uh, these known lattice models are. Uh, Include a free line model, which is useful for studying uh, F1 uh, instant model, uh, or for the F1 model in mathematical physics, uh, as well as U1 gauge theory. Um, and uh, the other example is a spin non decomposed uh, F2 non instant model. So, pretty much those are the known examples uh, which have topological operators for continuous value field defined on the lattice. And uh, yeah, after I introduce some more details of that, I think it will sort of uh, become clear why those are the only known examples. But when we want to go to more general problems, why the resolutions are sort of previously not known. Uh, yeah, so after I go to those steps, I will introduce the general idea of how to put a continuum from a field theory onto the lattice while retaining all of its topological effects. And uh, the general ideas. The general idea would be phrased in terms of using category theory, uh, which is a useful language for organizing our thoughts. However, uh, the whole purpose of this talk is that I will give this talk without introducing what category theory is. So um, I will not say I will not teach any category theory, but I, I what I hope is uh, sort of I will start with the most physical, most intuitive way of thinking. And step by step, you'll see that even if we just do the most traditional sort of thinking, you'll be step by step led to the use of category theory without we are assuming that you want to use some seemingly fancy mathematical language. So uh, the point is that category theory actually naturally pops up uh, when we want to resolve this uh, sort of real basic problem. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so those would be the the section that I hope to cover within the hour I have. And if I turn out have more time, or if someone just asked what is the detail of the construction, then I'll use that extra time to answer it. So I will uh, introduce my main constructions. Uh, well, mainly uh, covering the S3 non-instant model, or basically SU2 non-instant model, uh, which is the, the effective theory of the prior vacuum of the time series physics. Uh, yeah, the topological things will be served beyond uh, in three in three dimensions and when we don't get to term in two dimensions. And then uh, just like how the S1 analysis model is related to U1 gauge theory, the S3 analysis model is uh, sort of related to S2 and gauge theory mathematically because S3 is S2. So uh, for S2 and gauge theory, which also is also the other theory that appears in that history, the topological things will be instant on that the operator. And the uh, size is terms is where you want to go with that. So uh, that will be the structure of this talk. Okay, so uh, let's.
let's uh, start with uh, stating this problem. So QCD, of course, is a very beautiful subject. It's a, a theory that has a very simple elegant form. Uh, however, the dynamics is extremely rich. So uh, QCD has a very rich dynamic. And the dynamics is so rich that a lot of the times the computations we are interested in cannot be captured using the usual analytical means such as perturbation theory and so on. And therefore, uh, to handle such a rich non perturbative dynamics, uh, Wilson pioneered the development of a quantum field theory on the lattice, and in particular, lattice QCD. Uh, so, lattice QCD, by putting QCD as a continuum QFD onto the lattice, uh, we have uh, we gain two benefits. Uh, first, that uh, at the fundamental level, at the fundamental level, putting the theory on the lattice gives uh, a non perturbative uh, UV complete uh, definition of the casting cycle because uh, we all know that in a continuum casting cycle, we say, okay, we integrate over all. Gauge uh, or field configurations, but we don't really know what that means uh, most of the time. Um, so the uh, continuum pattern for is not very well defined, but once we put it on that, it's clear uh, what the pattern integral really means explicitly. So that's a fundamental advantage. And of course, uh, the practical advantage is that uh, it allows us to do a uh, Monte Carlo computation for a lot of the problems that we are interested in. So the Monte Carlo computation will be done on a four-dimensional hyperplanar lattice uh, in the distributed system. Right. Uh, so that's why Fendi's uh, QCD is uh, extremely useful tools for understanding the definition of QCD and for computing non-perturbative effects. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one uh, aspect, interesting aspect of the rich dynamics that QCD has. Is that this uh, young Mills stage field in QCD uh, has a topological configuration uh, called uh, instant ones. And uh, the instant ones are defined as the following the density of instant ones uh, is defined by uh, one half of uh, three F, red F, uh, where F is the young Mills field strength. And uh, the total number, the total number of the instant ones in the space time would be the integral over a four dimensional space time of the instant one density. Uh, so here I written this as a closed manifold integral, but it can also be a, like an infinite dimensional space time with suitable boundary conditions where the field strength goes towards zero and infinite far distance. Um, yeah, so that that's uh, the instant on density and the total instant on number, and uh, it is a topological configuration in the sense that the total instant on number will always uh, be an integer. So this integral will always give you an integer, and this integer is uh, actually captured by phi three of S to N, the third homotopy field of S to N. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, this should more or less be familiar to the uh, high energy community. So, uh, should, should I explain this? Or, okay, then, then I'll skip the explanation. And uh, it should be familiar from high energy physics that the instant number is given by I3 of S to N. Uh, right. And then uh, the curious situation is this. Uh, on, on one hand, uh, lattice QCD is a very important tool. For understanding and computing things in QCD. And on the other hand, instant ones, they are a very important uh, effect of QCD. And the problem is that they don't go very well together. So the problem, which has uh, existed for over 40 years, basically since the very beginning of that is QCD, this problem has been there. The problem is uh, there is uh, no natural. Uh, Definition of uh, instant on operator uh, in that QCD. Right, so there is this problem. And uh, yeah, and uh, we will introduce this uh, in talk uh, 
from this problem and this problem, how, 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 how what, what motivated me to do this study. But as we'll see very soon, that this problem is actually related to a very large part of the problem. Okay. Yes. Are we doing this like No, yeah, that's a very good question. The, the key thing is even in the pure Yamil theory. Uh, well, so why everything is expressed here in the Yamil theory? Only, yeah, the, the problem is very important. Right, so now let's uh, understand why there is such a problem. And the origin is very easy to see. And, and by seeing the origin, it's very easy to know that it's related to a, a, lot, a, a lot of other problems. So let's uh, first review what lattice fields do that. In lattice fields, you see we have a four dimensional Euclidean lattice, uh, but let's just show a lattice field. So uh, on the vertices, we will have uh, the matter fields, which are the parts, which is not the focus uh, of this region. Now, on the other hand, the uh, gauge fields live on the lead, and the gauge fields, uh, let's label this lead by L, the gauge fields. Was uh, lived in the tree, which in the case of the that we care about is actually that. Uh, right. And how is it related to relate uh, related to continuum theory, roughly speaking? It is that when this lead variable is close to identity, uh, you can uh, expand it, and so it's roughly speaking with one plus i a. Right. So so on the link you have a, a, an element from the gauge group, uh, and and it's Sort of intuitive that the gauge group, the, the gauge field is on the link while the matter is on the vertex, because the gauge field is also called the connection. So, so the name already suggests that it lives on the link. And also in the continuum, A has a, like a space time effect, right? So it sort of points in some direction. So it's intuitive that the gauge field is on the link. And then um, the gauge field strength is uh, the following. If you just consider the smallest Wilson loop on the lattice possible, that would be a Wilson loop around a single lattice plaquette C. And then uh, on this uh, plaquette, you will take the order product uh, of the QL around the link. Well, so because Q is not a billion, so the product has to be taken in the, in the cat order. And um, its relation to the continuum theory is that if all of those are close to identity, then roughly speaking, the Wilson loop that if you go around the ring, one plus i f, where f is roughly speaking the field strength of the ring plus f. And then in lattice field CD, you will uh, weight your field configuration uh, in, using the lattice field strength and, and, and then do the Monte Carlo. So uh, that's what lattice field and by knowing what, what how, how the lattice field can work, it's uh, very easy to see the origin of the problem. So the origin of the problem uh, is this. Uh, let's consider the total uh, configuration space. Uh, focusing on the downhill part of the theory only. Then the total configuration space would be product over all links. And then of each link, there is a, a group F, uh, a group which uh, gauge group, which is in this case is S to F. Why is that? Well, of each link, we have a link variable which takes value in S to F. And we have many links, so the total configuration space of the gauge group is just a product of those links. Uh, and uh, in the uh, continuum QCD, we know that uh, the gauge field should determine at least a number, number, right? So that if we want to do the same thing on the lattice, it, it means that there should be some function from the uh, configuration of the gauge field to the integer, uh, which is the uh, least number, number. But then you you see the problem is this: uh, the space on the left hand side is kinetic, right? Each S to F has only one kinetic component, so the product of them is also kinetic. Uh, but on the on the right hand side, the, the topological number is uh, discrete. So if you want to map that can map to different instant of number, not just a single possible value, then then the map cannot be continuous, right? Because this has only one kinetic component, while that is discrete. 
So if you want continuous map, then you can only have one map. If you want continuous map, the map will not be continuous. And if it's not continuous, then we sort of feel that it's uh, mathematically unnatural, unnatural, right? Yeah, so this is the origin of the problem. It's very simple to explain. And uh, we can see that the, the problem is actually very general. It does not apply to, to uh, this particular case. It occurs whenever we have a uh, continuous value. Uh, we have continuous value fields with uh, topological configurations. Regardless of the fields are like gauge fields or meta field or whatever. As long as they are continuous values and they have topological configuration, where you want to put the uh, continuum theory also the lattice theory under the same problem. Because on the lattice, the left hand side usually is on the active configuration space, and the right hand side will be the discrete topological number. But Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit confused with your argument. Because in the continuous theory, basically what you do is say that the field dies at infinity, so right. space time is basically that's right. three. And we can we just ask how many times you can wrap around that swim. So right. by three of that swim, this gives us discrete right. things. So could we just do a similar construction here? We pick right. like some uh, you know, even if it's just a plaquette, how many times yeah. we wind and right. Plaquette. But the key is uh here is uh the space time is continuous, then you have a notion of the field very continuously. Right. Here the links are discrete. So you have this product of the links. Then there's no notion of like the field varying continuously. But that's indeed a key point that will connect the continuum on, on the lattice. And, and actually my resolution will be to explain that uh, intuition. Right. But just for now, just at the at like at in, in sort of this traditional method theory, uh the, the photo configuration space space exists. You have no notion of like continuously varying. But, but I guess like if I had uh, a lattice, yeah. I could think of a uh, some link wrapping around this lattice and just count how many times it wraps around. Yeah, but you know the total configuration space exists. Then the wrapping number, if you want to assign any sort of wrapping number, the map might be not basically. So how does the continuum theory get around with it? But, right, that's a good point. So first of all, the disadvantage of the continuum theory is that Total configuration space does not have a nice representation like this, right? So that that's why the passive network is not very well defined. Uh, what we what we gain from by putting the things on the lattice is that we have this being well defined. On the other hand, in the continuum theory, although the configuration space is not very well defined, but we sort of know what 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 it is. And then the key is that in the continuum you have different uh, principal bundles, SQM bundles over the space time, and Although within each bundle, the connections can vary continuously, but different bundles are disconnected from each other. So there you are mapping the like the separate the bundle, uh, the uh, topological classes of bundles, which are disconnected from each other through the internal number. But on the left is this is your total configuration space. You don't see any sort of disconnected uh, components, unlike in the continuum where you have this. Right. Right. So yeah, so in the context of gauge theory, the problem we want to resolve can also be phrased in this way. That is uh, in the continuum, there's the notion of uh principal bundle, which are topological, which can be topologically distinct. On the left is what is the counterpart? Yeah, you can also ask this. And yeah, so there are different angles to ask the same question, and the uh, final answer all of the uh, lies in chat I told you. I guess, I guess my point is like if I was doing font where for example like toric code, yeah, I just have this lattice and I can wrap configurations around the lattice. And why why can't I do this here? Well, for toric code, the configuration space is discrete to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a D two gauge theory. Each link has a D two variable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we can see that. Yeah, that's why I emphasize continuous value fields here. Is your argument that the first question was the continuous theory is a constant in large order limit? Then this constant is not true. Yeah, I, I will uh, sort of say what people do now. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, this is the origin of the problem. The origin is very simple, and we can see it's actually very general. It's really a large part of the problem. So the hope is that if we motivate ourselves towards some resolution starting from this problem, we are actually moving towards solving a whole lot of problems and maybe understand the relation between continuous GFC and metric GFC more systematically. Right. So let's uh, let's look at some vague ideas how how the problem. Uh, how, how to get around this problem. So the zero idea would be sort of, I should say give up, but uh, it would be just to allow this continuity. And well, it's actually far from giving up. It's actually also something interesting to consider. And that's what people currently do. Uh, right. The current resolution is to allow this continuity. As long as, uh, so this continuity occur uh, occur at uh, this uh, highly um, highly fluctuating highly fluctuating uh, field configurations. Uh, by highly fluctuating, it means like all of these, uh, or maybe not all, but many of these, uh, or some of these, uh, plaquettes field strands are very far from that. So it's uh, highly fluctuating. As long as they are highly fluctuating, uh, your your uh, Monte Carlo weight or your your path uh, for weight will be such that uh, these configurations occur at small weight in the Monte Carlo. So so okay, you have this continuity which is undesirable, but they occur at small weight. So let's just go with it. So that's uh, the current way of doing it. Um, so currently they have uh, some different protocols of doing this. And actually, each of these protocols are very deeply studied. They are they have very nice mathematical structure and so on. Um, but in the end, they still give a discontinuity. Uh, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, I would say this current method is still very, very nice and very successful. However, if we just uh, uh, if, however, in the end, there will be some of this continuity somewhere. And uh, first of all, mathematically, it seems like uh, it's not totally satisfactory. And moreover, um, um, there's no particular theoretical reason that you want more natural mathematically well defined uh, uh, operator on the lattice. Um, that is uh, com that comes from the uh, example, from this known example, which I'll introduce later. But uh, the story basically is that in these known examples, being able to define those topological operators in a natural manner. Is not only useful for I mean, doing these marriages, but so it's also important for uh, analytical studies. For example, uh, Barry Zinsky used this vortex operator in uh, his S1 and model to derive the DKT transition. And, uh, uh, and then one can also use that to prove, uh, use these uh, operators, these explicit proposed operators, to prove both on vortex duality. Which in certain limits will become the counterpart of T duality in string theory and so on. And you can also do this for like electromagnetic duality and so on. So uh, being able to define these topological operators in a natural mathematical uh, manner is not only useful for just satisfying our I don't know, values or something, it, it's also uh, useful for analytical studies. It's also not just a aspect of field duality. And also, at a practical level, uh, people currently only use this method to compute the boundaries of the distance, total distance per number. However, uh, if they, however, uh, if they want to do, for example, a distance density, then the current method will will not work so well. Uh, however, it's a natural problem to ask about correlation functions that involve the instance density. For example, I can ask if I have an instant function density, like an instant density at position x, how does it influence some, I don't know, some part behavior elsewhere, right? It's a natural question to ask, right? This kind of question. But currently, the current method uh, mostly works only for the total instant function density. And I'll say these kind of questions are important in QCD because in QCD, one major problem is. That the rule of instant one in confinement is not well understood. Of course, confinement is extremely important. It gives rise to this proton neutron, which produces this world we live in. Uh, and the rule of instant one is played in, uh, in confinement, it's not very well understood. So, these problems, I think, would be generally important. Right. So, these are the 
these are the reasons why, uh, although the current methods are very sophisticatedly developed, but we have some reasons to not be totally satisfied with them. Okay, so then what are some of the things that we can do? Uh, the first thing we can do is that how about we just have discrete uh, degrees of freedom on the lattice to begin with? Then, then this this would be the configuration space would be discrete and we will not encompass this continuity. But then you will put a question mark on this. This is QCD that we are working on. Why would you expect there to be any discrete number of freedom to appear in QCD? So here I would like to emphasize an important point. That is, uh, what fields you use to present your quantum field theory is unimportant because whatever fields you present, you use to present your quantum field theory will be integrated out in the end anyway, right? So what fields you use to present quantum field theory is, is uh, not, not, not the fundamental. The fundamental thing is the operators and their correlations and so on. Um, this should be familiar from the author of duality where you can present the same theory using very different fields. So that means uh, since we are not working with a classical problem, but a quantum field theory, a priori, it is okay that if our lattice theory will involve discrete degrees of freedom, even though the Cartesian theory doesn't, right? So this is actually not a problem. In fact, a good argument for us to actually consider finding such a presentation of QCD with this critical freedom is the very problem itself. But the very problem itself suggests that if you have this three degree freedom in your presentation, it will help you. Right. So if I think about the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, that sort of variance in the physics, right? Or like the, the like dimension of the physical open space and things like that. Yeah, you can add in three degrees of freedom and the variance, but it, it just seems that you would always get away with having well, I, I don't know if the whole two dimension physics is that fundamental because I, I to me more what's more fundamental is the theory that you should use with proper circles, including topological ones and topological ones. Uh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. And in dualities we do a lot of times we do, we do see that and sometimes we may also come to the case where we go to Okay, uh, so that's one possibility. And the second possibility is that uh, we still work with continuous value fields. However, uh, instead of uh, assigning a field configuration, assigning an, an, an instant one number to a field configuration, which is what we expect from the continuum, right? So the field configuration determines an instant one number. Instead of doing that, we now uh, map a field configuration for a probability profile uh, of instant one number. Why would that help? Uh, well, uh, let's just draw some simple picture. This is the instant one number, and then that's the probability profile under a given field configuration. So maybe in this field configuration, it looks like that. And then if you uh, Vary your field configuration uh, smoothly. Uh, the profile might might become something like that. Right? So in this case, when you vary the field smoothly, the probability profile still varies smoothly. However, the highest probability configuration might jump. Right? So that's how this idea is related to the first idea of allowing this continuity. However, because now we are using a probability profile instead of a fixed number, so no discontinuity occurs, right? Because of the probability, probabilistic measure rules out the discontinuity when the probability profile is passed across over. Yeah. So uh, that also has, is a sort of idea. And you can also ask, okay, the continuum, the relation between the uh, field and the uh, instant number is just deterministic, whether it is okay for that to be probabilistic uh, on the lattice. But again, we are doing a path integral, things will be path integrated over anyways. So it doesn't seem to be an obvious problem. 
And moreover, I think it's a good argument that that this should not be a problem because if you think of the lattice as being embedded in the continuum, then the lattice uh, Monte Carlo would be like sampling things from the continuum. And then by sampling things, you should not be able, to, you should not expect yourself to be able to infer the full information in the continuum. But you, you can probably infer the information in the continuum probabilistically. I may have thought the intuition was the other way around in the sense that the continuum field space is the low energy field space of uh, the uh, ladder, uh -huh. which is what I thought was the resolution space. In that, yes, the UV field space is connected, but there's a low energy parabolic uh, uh, zero on the so the yeah. continuum field space is, yeah, it is, for instance, as you said, it's a dynamic and slow invariant. Um, that means that the infrared field space. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. One of those proposals would be to prohibit some configuration in the quantum mechanics. It's not that we prohibit them, per se, but we take the low energy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's how it's right. However, if you want this thing to be well defined on the lattice, uh, you, you, well, so, so I, I think the idea is some, 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 some like this. So if like you have worked a lot on this topological field theory, and in topological field theories, the lattice theory and the continuum theory actually sort of go both ways. You sort of know uh, what are the IR limits of the what you want in the IR limits of the continuum theory, then you use that to define the lattice theory using this category uh, machinery, right? So you can reconstruct a lattice theory that produces those low energy fields. So you sort of want a relation that can go both ways. Uh, so a priori lock lock is when we go from like um yeah maybe maybe uh, let me just introduce what I would do in the end and I guess it will be clearer clearer what do we think. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's uh, those two ideas, and uh, it turns out that uh, the final resolution. Uh, that I'll introduce will involve those ideas in a complementary way. So if one and two are complementary, in the following sense, uh, we have this uh, original fields. We have this original fields on on the lattice, which are these fields that we would expect from a traditional lattice. And uh, we also have some extra fields. We also have some extra fields on the lattice, and some of those are discrete. Some of those are discrete. So here we are using this idea. Uh, so this is idea one. And then if we integrate out, if we integrate out these extra fields, then uh, we will recover a theory only in terms of the original field. Right. However, the original fields and the uh, and the extra fields have some joint probability. So when you integrate out the extra fields, it would it would say that because the extra fields determine the topological number. So then when you integrate out extra fields and they have joint probability, then that means that the topological number which depends on which is determined by extra fields will actually be a probability profile that's conditioned on the original. Right. So idea one and idea two are not contradictory to each other. They are complementary. If you don't integrate out the extra fields, then it would be idea one. If you think of the extra fields as being integrated out already, then you get idea two. They are complementary. Okay. And because uh, this this sort of has to be the final resolution because these are pretty much all the possibilities you can think of. So if you are un unhappy with possibility zero, then you are left with this. So this sort of has to be your final resolution. The only thing is that uh, what I described here is vague. It's vague. But uh, the, the thing is how to how to make it a concrete theory, how to decide, uh, how to decide what those extra views are and probably what those joint probability are, so that the theory gives you what you want, right? But this has to be sort of be the general idea. Right, right, right. So, uh, yeah, so that's uh, a motivating example. But uh, we'll see that uh, 
So there are some gaps between the known examples and what we want. So it's so a the theory is the key to overcome that gap. You also need to think about ads and speed things, or do you mean you can replace all these fields with different different things? Uh, so you you keep the original fields because you want them to couple to the other operators that you're interested in, for example, the sparks and so on. But then you also will introduce this category. Right, so that would be uh, the favorite solution, and uh, as Blaine point out, that that's uh, actually the uh, what that's actually what one can learn from the delay model. So I'll, my next step would be to explain the delay model in details for those of you who are not familiar with it. And over, I'll explain the delay model. Even if you're familiar with it, I'll try to explain it in a language that will be convenient for explaining to you later. Uh, before we do that, let's. Uh, Let's uh, finish uh, the last part of the overview, which is uh, what 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 my goals would be. So uh, the goals, uh, the goals would uh, come in at uh, three levels. So the first level of goal would be this problem itself. This problem is uh, of course an important problem. In QCD, for example, it would help you, for example, understand better the rule of instant plot in confinement. So uh, this problem itself is uh, already very interesting, and uh, I want to emphasize that. Uh, oh, okay, let me emphasize that. And the second second level of goal uh, is the following: um, If you are interested, not 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 in QCD, but in more formal aspects of QFT, like especially uh, like TQFT or this. Uh, Symmetries. Um, so if we, if you wanna uh, uh, study these formal things, uh, yeah, that's uh, Michael explained it a lot. And uh, the formality thing, uh, if you do those on the lattice, you you might have if you're familiar with the field, you might have the impression that the formal things on the lattice are most uh, most of the time systematically studied for discrete values, uh, degrees of freedom. Or symmetries. So these are very systematically uh, studied. On the other hand, uh, for continuous values, uh, degrees of freedom or symmetries, uh, there are some studies, but not as uh, systematic as people did for discrete ones. And uh, and it turns out that the resolution uh, to this problem, even though this problem is not a TQFT, right? It's a general QFT with with citation in uh, intermediate energy scales. And these problems are not problems of phases, but problems at intermediate length scales or energy scales. This is not a TQFT, but uh, the sort of uh, mathematical tool from high energy theory we get from this study, which turned out uh, to be a yeah. bumper, which is something that I wanna promote uh, into its more general use in theoretical physics. Uh, I, I believe uh, with the use of NR functor, we will be able to more systematically study continuous degrees of freedom and symmetries uh, towards what we did for, for the discrete value one. Yeah, so that, that would be uh, the, the second level of the goal. And, and you can see that uh, by these two levels, I am sort of I'm also trying to uh, relate things in general to FT with uh, things people do in TQFT. Although I like in, in the present work, I am not able to fully achieve this, but one can sort of see that uh, the relation uh, should be there and we should be able to work out in the future. And uh, the third level of goal is a very distant goal, or you can say it's a very distant dream, is to uh, so understand better what a continuum QFT is. So, continuum QFT uh, has the problem that uh, the path integral is not very well defined. On the other hand, uh, the lattice QFT uh, has a very well defined path integral. And at least for convinced, better minded people, uh, a lot of times you want to think okay, we have continuum QFT, there must be some underlying lattice regu regulate, regularization, such that the well defined path integral will, be, will, will help us to define the continuum QFT. I don't know if that will be the true final story or not. But at least that's one way of thinking, and it's not only for condensed matter minded people. Also, there's this field called a constructive QFT, which I'm not very familiar with, but in the 80s, a small, small group of people did also did a lot of work with this 
direction. And uh, how is how this is related to the present work is that at least uh, with this present work, I think uh, we will have uh, using this Anna Pankers in particular, we will be more we will be able to more systematically uh, more systematically uh, relate uh, continuum curve Q to the lattice. So that uh, if we can more systematically uh, build this relation, maybe it will sort of more or less help us with this uh, problem by sort of pulling back the definition on the lattice of continuum. I'm not claiming we're anywhere near that, but I think if there is a final resolution to this problem, then uh, this high category theory's involvement of Anna Bunker uh, must be a necessary component of that, although certainly not sufficient. But I, I, I would believe uh, if the final resolution is in this direction, uh, what something I described here should be some necessary component of it. So that's a sort of a very distant level of goal. Right. So that uh, is uh, sort of my overview. Is there any questions? Okay. Uh, then I will introduce the belay model in a language that is uh, suitable for for my uh, for introducing my general idea. Um, right. So uh, what is the delay model? The delay model is a, a model for S1 magnetic model. So in the traditional S1 magnetic model, uh, let's say you have lattice vertices V and V prime and V L, and here you have some theta V and theta V prime uh, taking value in from between minus I and I. Right. So there are some angles. And then uh, you can define uh, across this link V theta L to be uh, theta V prime minus theta V. Uh, and uh, the partition function of the theory can be something like uh, you product over all vertices V. And for each vertex, you integrate uh, V theta from minus pi to pi. That's your passing through measure on the lattice, which is well defined. And then the weight on the lattice can be the product over each link. And then uh, on each link, you have something like uh, one minus cosine E theta over the link L. So that would be the passing through weight. And uh, the, the rule of cosine here, it doesn't have to be cosine. But uh, what is important here is that uh, it has a full type here. This is because theta is a uh, well defined not too high. So this would be uh, a traditional S1 Lanisima model on the lattice. Uh, and uh, okay, so so uh, there is this general problem we stated before that once you have these continuous value fields, uh, when you uh, and you have a when you want to consider topological configurations, you encounter some problem. And here the topological configurations are that. Uh, in one dimension, you can have a winding, which is like, uh, for example, if I go a one dimensional loop with six vert vertices, uh, if the theta configuration looks like that, you sort of feel that there is some sort of winding, right? But you cannot have a, an explicit operator that captures this winding because of the a general reason that I stated before, right? The total configuration space, which is this, is connected. So you cannot map that continuously to a, to a, to a like discrete proportional number. Uh, and associated with that in 2D or higher, you have a vortices, which is like a lattice or square lattice. And in the middle, you have these speeds going around there, uh, something like that. So here you sort of feel that there is a vortex in the middle, but for the same reason as I said before, you, you don't have an explicit operator capturing the vortex. Okay, uh, I'll keep this for. Uh, and the resolution. Oh, I actually wanted to do this. Let's erase both of them there. Uh, the resolution, the resolution to this problem, 
uh, like the delay presentation of the X Y model. So the delay presentation works like this. So uh, this way. So, so I'll first I will introduce several perspectives. So let's uh, introduce the most explicit perspective first. This function, uh, this weight of each thing looks like that, uh, where the periodicity is too high because it's well, too high periodic by by requirement. And uh, the delay model is to approximate this. By a series of Gaussian. So, if you sum up this Gaussian, it will be uh, reproduces this picture as a this series of two pi here. Uh, in terms of formula, you'll be writing a uh, sum over an integer, which is basically this separate Gaussian and uh, e to the minus 1 over 2 p. Uh, P is based of a two pi m over the mean square. So this is the Gaussian and m, this integer m controls the position of, of, of the center of the Gaussian. Right? So so this is what the relay model does. At the beginning, it seems the important thing of the relay model is that you approximate this thing by a Gaussian so that you can do Gaussian integral. Of course, that's an, a useful aspect. But I would say the more important aspect is the introduction of this m. With the introduction of this F, you are able to define a topological thing. For example, uh, the winding number, the winding number would be given by uh, the lattice loop integral of uh, C theta plus two pi M over all links. Uh, and let's divide by two pi. And because C theta is uh, sort of this exact. So when you sum over the lattice loop, but this, this integral means uh, sum over each thing on the one-dimensional loop. Uh, only the m part will be left, so it will be sum over all links on the loop and ml. And of course, this is an integral. Why is this capturing the uh, winding number? Well, because uh, let's see what what m does here. So if we fix theta to go from minus pi to pi. In this configuration, most of the C theta, the difference between theta are small, except for on this thing. On this thing, theta, this theta is near plus pi, and that theta is near minus pi, right? So the C theta across this thing will be close to two pi. And then, uh, and then if very often have the D theta on this thing will have a small weight. However, you can choose, you can uh, sample y to be, uh, sorry, m to be one there. So that on this thing, m is one and m on other links are zero. That configuration would uh, have higher probability. That's, that is to say, given this theta configuration with high probability, m would be taking value one here and zero elsewhere. So uh, that's why with high probability, uh, the winding number defined by this would be one, which agrees with our intuition. Um, so this is how the delay model works. And also the vorticity uh, in two dimension, in two dimension is given by P of uh, D theta plus two pi m, where P is the lattice curl. It's like uh, if we, this is on a plaquette. If you have a uh, T on a plaquette, that means that the sum of these uh, link variables in following direction. And that will be PM. So that is pro of M on the podcast, which is again an integer. So this uh, will give you the vorticity number uh, to be well, so the M will most likely be one here and be one here and upper here, but zero elsewhere. So with high probability, the vorticity number will be one, which is you know, like that, which agrees with our intuition. So this is the explicit presentation of this line model showing that. By doing this transformation, uh, you can do transformation of what? By doing this, you are able to explicitly capture the topological number. And this indeed is the I suggest um, is the, along the lines of uh, our general idea before, where you have this 
original variable theta and an extra variable m that they have a joint uh, probability distribution, and the topological number is determined by m, and therefore it will be conditional on theta probability. So, so something is just added to the previous theta for the original. So these are two different bytes. Yes, they flow to the same thing. Yes. So when we were talking about adding the speed to previous freedom, we we weren't talking about sort of adding it into the usual lattice formulation we already. Right. Does the curve also the same? Yeah. 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 Right. So this is explicitly how it works. And now our purpose is to elevate this to a more general picture. So now uh, we need to. Uh, Sort of uh, give a little bit of uh, deeper understanding of why this would work. Right. So uh, I'll introduce the perspective. Uh, I will introduce two perspectives. Uh, one perspective is a geometrical perspective. Why this introduction of M help us to capture the line more consistent? The geometrical understanding is this. Now we have this lattice string, theta p and theta p prime, is fixed here. Now we think of this lattice thing as being embedded in a continuum. If we think of the lattice thing as being embedded in a continuum, then this lattice thing would be a path, would be a smooth path in the continuum space time. And uh, the theta will, will, will take some value of theta x, where x is the position along this path, right? So theta x is some, some value that changes smoothly from theta b to theta b prime. And if we draw a circle of theta, let's say theta b is here and theta b prime is here, theta x can go like along this path or this path, or it can wind around a few times before reaching theta b prime, right? So M is indeed capturing all those possibilities. So in this geometrical picture, the d theta plus two pi M on the lattice is actually uh, the same as the integral of d theta x. Uh, from B to B prime, right? The the mod two pi part is de determined, but there is also a possible like integer part which is captured by that. So that that is the geometrical picture that relates the lattice and the continuum. So by introducing this M, our lattice theory is actually approximating the continuum theory a little bit better, and now we are able to find this topological thing. Uh, right, is there a question about this? Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's uh, look at an algebraic uh, understanding of why this would work. In the algebraic understanding, uh, on the vertices, we have uh, this by uh, two one variable. And uh, on the links, what we do is actually we are doing uh, 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 finding the universal cover of U1. Where this U1 is uh, roughly speaking theta, and this B is roughly speaking M, and this R is, is D theta plus 2 pi M. Why is finding the universal cover U1 useful? The reason is the following. The topological thing we are interested in actually lies in the pi 1 of U1, right? The winding numbers or the vorticity comes from the pi 1 of U1. And by going to the universal cover of U1 with the kernel Z, uh, it turns out that the pi one of u one will be completely captured by the pi zero of v. That's why we want to look, look at this universal cover. So uh, it's useful for capturing pi one. So that originally we are interested in pi one of u, but in the end we will be casting the discreteness of the integer variable m. So the pi one of u is captured in pi zero of v, and that's algebraically why it works. And by this. Uh, Understanding, you can easily see that it not only works for U1. For any target space in X, uh, which has some non trivial pi 1, you just, um, you just do the universal cover, then the pi 1 will be captured into the pi, pi 0 of this gamma, the, this uh, as a generalization of this. That is how immediately that the benign model is good for capturing pi 1 in general. Okay, by, by doing this. And uh, since I don't have much time, I just want to briefly mention that uh, you can also use the same idea for a U1 gauge theory 
uh, except now HPO originally the U1 thing came from the vertex. Now, now the theta will become uh, AL sticking on the link, but uh, still U1. And then uh, the M originally sticking on the link, and this would be the plus FP, which is given by EA plus 2 pi S, uh, which is on the top cat. Basically, everything is in one higher dimension. And then the, the winding number will become uh, the Dirac. Dirac, uh, Dirac quantized plus, which is like here is the integral of this is an integer, there is the integral of f is an integer, the Dirac quantized plus, and the vorticity will become a monopole. Okay, just put everything in one higher dimension and you'll see the vertices in the And with that beta nice U1 H theory, you can also do a lot of things, such as a confinement back to our theory. Uh, like um, a billion instant on and so on, all, all those formal effects work out nicely. Right. So then, this is the uh, not only a useful trick, it's, it actually has something deep and, and useful in one of the uh, deep results as well. Uh, right. So these are those two known examples. And then let me also briefly introduce this known example, which basically are all the known examples. Uh, that example is probably familiar for people who work on conventional physics. And in there, let's just uh, do this as a very perspective. On the vertices, we have uh, an S2, uh, which can be thought of as a direction of a spin. Right. And then the interesting topological configuration will be pi 2 of S2. For example, uh, the hex hole configuration, which is the generalization of the vortex, like you have this spin sticking out. From this uh, central field, you start to know what I'm talking about, right? This hex off where the spin directions are all sticking out from the center. That's a generalization of for this for hex two. Then you want to capture the proportional configuration by characterized by pi two of hex two, uh, and the spin on the composition, which is very well, well known, also known as a CP one representation, is to first cover this by an F two two with some U one on the lead. So that uh, the pi two of S two will be captured into the pi one of U one, and then you further realize it. Uh, so that on the plus set, uh, you have some pi zero variable on the plus set that captures the pi two of the S four. That is just uh, something that's familiar for the entire history of the life S two two. Speaks to you one story by Ramon uh, of and Koyako. Maybe that the U1 monopole of this, the U monopole, this U1 ratio is the hash of, of this, uh, this uh, S2. Yeah, this is sort of familiar in conventional physics. Right, so you can see that there's a very picture of the benign model as a generalized to this uh, spin on this uh, S2 nothing. Uh, I'll skip the geometric picture, but it's like a four pattern. Now, uh, now our problem of interest would be this uh, thing that deals with S3, and hopefully you'll be interested in pi 3 of things, right? And now we now we will see why these are the only known examples that could have worked out without thinking about parity theory. And those more general cases, I think, uh, can pretty much can only work out if we think more systematically. Uh, let's just focus on the SU2 Nanissima model because by putting everything, roughly speaking, by putting everything one dimensional higher uh, in pedigree theories for the looping, if you do that, it will get, get you a theory. So for simplicity, let's focus on the SU2 Nanissima model. Uh, in the SU2 Nanissima model, you might want that in the traditional lattice theory, you know that uh, on the vertex, you have some S2, SU2 variable, like the pi on vacuum. And that's all you have in the traditional lattice theory. By following that reasoning and doing a generalization, okay, since we are interested in the pi three of the SU2 uh, model, let's uh, maybe find some covering space such that the pi three here is captured to pi two here, and then do something such that the pi two there is captured to pi one here. And since the, it's the pi one, most likely this thing will be u one. 
and then in the uppermost layer we can minimize it so that the final thing will be captured in the uh, I zero here on, on, on the cube, right? That's a natural generalization of the ideas there. Um, and you also can sort of guess what these higher dimensional things are. So this thing on the cube would be associated with the spermial number, just like how the M here is associated with the winding number, right? So the highest dimension thing would be associated with the spermial number. And this thing would be the West you know, winter term, uh, which is basically the integral, the 3D integral of some trace three inverse PG. Um, just like how the integral around D theta gives you a, a around a closed loop gives you an integer number. So this would be the Western minimal vision term. And that's, that will be the Western minimal vision term, which is basically that this Western minimal vision term can locally be written as, as P of something. And that P of something is what this blue one roughly captures. I'll finish. Yeah. So uh, you're right. So that's sort of what you might want to do. But then uh, you will see some problem here. Here, the, uh, you, it's crucial that the, the, uh, the whatever you fill in here has I2. But this is uh, some linked variable. And for a linked variable, you sort of want to be able to compose the linked variable here and compare with the linked variables composed over there and maybe compare the result. Right? You want to somehow be able to compose the linked variable. However, okay, so the things that we know can compose at least the familiar thing are, are um, groups, right? However, we also know that the nice groups that we are happy with, the finite dimensional compact groups don't have non-trivial type, right? So that is why those are now casted in this language, we sort of understand why those are the only examples that have, people have worked out before. Uh, we, we want to put things that we are familiar here, like groups, but there are no nice groups that have non-trivial pi tools that can capture the rules, uh, that, that can play the rules. So, uh, yeah, so now we face two possibilities. One is to go with infinite dimensional groups. Okay, but this idea is not good for a lattice theory, right? Because if we want to do multi colors of things, we better want things to be finite dimensional. But if we think even deep, uh, more deeply, what is the infinite dimensional thing? Why we don't like infinite dimensional thing on the left? It's because infinite dimensional thing would be the same as continuum thing. Right? <coughs> so let's say uh, here I draw a two sphere, but it actually represents a three sphere of SU2. And then I fix two points here, uh, Q and Q prime. In the continuum, if you think of, if you just use this picture or think of this lattice being as being embedded in the continuum, then in the target space, the lattice thing will trace out some path from here on, on the uh, on the SU2. However, the shape of the path can take, can be, it's infinite dimensional, right? You can take all possible shapes. So this is infinite dimensional. But in fact, this is just what this is. What these choices are uh, basically, uh, if you know what path group here is, so this would be the path group, and this will be the loop group here, and this will be the path of the loop group. Um, so basically, if you don't know what those are, it's okay. It just is a generalization of that geometric idea of uh, of putting uh, the lattice in a continuum, then the path will trace out some path in the target space. But that's infinite dimensional. However, it is good to know that the infinite dimensional actually just correspond to continuum theory. And the other possibility would be more suitable for the lattice is uh, to have something that's finite dimensional, but it is not a group. Although it is not a group, we still want a sense of that, that we want to be able to compose these things and then compare the result, right? And it turns out that the things that are finite dimensional, but they are not groups. Uh, right, right, so what is the requirement then? If this, if we, we are working with things we are not familiar with, what, what do we want it to do? We want it such that uh, these two are topologically equivalent. Right, because this is a continuum theory and we want to capture topological things in a continuum theory. 
So we, but we want the, the thing to capture it to be finite dimensional, but we still want uh, it to be topologically equivalent. And uh, that is where category theory becomes useful because category theory is the natural language for you to organize the idea of what, what does it mean for something to be equivalent or not. So, uh, yeah. So if we, we do not use category theory, then it will be very hard for us to come up with something that's not a group that doesn't work nicely, but uh, somehow is equivalent to what we have in a continuum. But category theory is uh, useful for, for elucidating what we really want here. And it turns out that the structure here we want uh, is such that uh, the composition, the composition is not only non-unique. So if you work with T to FT, uh, non-unique composition is probably familiar, like this F symbol in T to FT. The composition is, sorry, not non-associated, non is a familiar, the F symbol, the F symbol is the non-associated composition. But here, the composition is not only non-associated, it's uh, the result of the composition, you need some structure where the composition is non-unique, but such that the, the final structure still makes sense. And in this case, um, the structure we need uh, will be called a uh, multiplicative bundle term, uh, which has been worked out by mathematicians uh, under, well, similar topological context, but not as a lattice physics theory. Oh, sorry, not so, uh, multiplicative bundle term. So these seemingly bizarre structures, which doesn't seem to be relevant to the familiar physics, is actually necessary when you want to put a familiar physics of QCD which is phrased in terms of groups onto the lattice. Although this thing seems very different from the familiar group, but, but it, it actually becomes a necessity, necessity on the lattice. And uh, right, so that's uh, what category theory is uh, useful for. And uh, yeah, this is, since I already am five minutes, uh, I already exist five minutes, uh, I will end here. But, but I can give some more general picture as well as some more detailed constructions if you are interested. Thank you. Say a little bit about what a final yeah construction would look like. Just um, uh -huh. suppose you're a very suppose um maybe that one way to frame the question is suppose I'm just like someone who's going to actually do the simulation on a computer. I just want to know right. the operation. What does the right. model look like? Right. So the in in details. Uh, of course, uh, just like anything in category theory construction, it's not unique. But let me just give one construction that is relatively easy to describe. Um, in the traditional lattice theory, let's say a non-exima model, uh, F U two in particular. If you already sample Q and vertex P and Q and vertex P prime here, if you already sample those on the link, uh, let us call this Q and P prime. On the link, the link thing will be Q prime Q inverse, right? That's the traditional lattice theory, and this uh, also belongs to Q, which is that U two. Yeah, yeah, we are considering a non instrument model. I'm saying we are, we are considering a non instrument model because when we want to go to gauge theory, we sort of put everything in one diagram. I just for the simplicity of showing the pictures, I was a non instrument model. Yeah. So the, the, in a non instrument model, the G will live on the vertex. And that, that, would be what, that would be what you have in traditional lattice theory. Uh, in, in, the, in this sort of generalized plane relaying theory, you want some cover of G. But we already know that if we want the cover to do something we want, it cannot be approved. So uh, so we will have uh, some something that that has another label, roughly speaking, uh, in Y, which covers G. And Y will be uh, S2 removing minus one. That's like one patch covering S2. Uh, Destroy union with SU2 removing plus one. That will be two patches covering SU2. Of course, this is not a group anymore. Right? SU2 is a group, but once you separate into patches, it's no longer a group. Like when you compose two of the elements, how do you know which patch you end up on, right? So it's no longer a group. But that's sort of 
why I say the composition is not unique, but the key is that it still makes sense. So let's see what we want to do with it. So first of all, this S labels uh, which patch it lies in. Okay, so for for most values of G prime G inverse, unless it's plus or minus one, otherwise this can lie in either patch, right? So S can in general take two values. Right, so that's something you need to sample on the lattice. And uh, so on the lattice thing, uh, originally, uh, let's say that's some eigenvalue. Well, let, let's write uh, this equal to uh, nu e to the i lambda nu inverse. So traditionally, you will uh, maybe sample based on the trace of this, right, which is, will be some function of the eigenvalue. Sorry, lambda is not be. Right, will be the uh, yeah, so from zero to pi. Traditionally, you will sample something so that the weight on a big book looks something like that. Just like here, you separate these things into a sum of things. Here, you separate this uh, into something like that and something like that. You separate that into a sum of two, two, uh, two, two curves. Uh, one corresponds to S being in. That patch. So this curve corresponds to that patch, and the other curve corresponds to that patch. Basically, when it's closer to identity, it will more likely be to this patch. When it's further closer to minus identity, it will more likely be to this patch. So this is just like doing that. That's something you want to sample. Uh, and well, this is not something you feel in here. Actually, it's like you're replacing this entire structure by this multiplicative quantum term. Um, so y will be something in the middle layer. But the key is you are with this y, you are able to transmit the pi three information onto some pi one into some u one of the plus s, right? So uh, for that purpose, let's consider a sort of a weird two vertex plus s first. For the two vertex plus s, you 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 know you want some u one variable. And then let's say you have already sampled here in Q prime and S1 and S2 here. And then you, you have some U1 variable on here. However, in general, the U1 variable, like the configuration space over this total plaquette, would not be like a U1 times other things. In general, it will be a U1 bundle of this other variable, right? So it's not U1 times this other thing, but a U1 bundle on this three U prime and and the U1 bundle would be such would, would be the following. Let's uh let's use this to motivate what the U1 bundle is look like. So uh, let's consider uh, S1 uh, and S4 are different, which means uh, U, U, uh which means uh, U prime is not equal to plus minus U. So that means uh, the configuration space of uh, U prime. Is actually uh, S3 removing two points, which is uh, homotopic to S2. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? That that is that S2 is just the F, F2 parameterized by this U. This U lives in S2, however, it has this U1 gate redundancy that commutes with the uh, eigenvalue, right? So the U actually parameterized S2. So this S2 is nothing but the but what is parameterized by U. So, but we are, again, this U itself is in SU2. So, so U actually already contains this structure. And that's what we need. So, when S1 and S2 are different, uh, when S1 and S2 are different, the choice of values of U is from what to S2, parameterized by the U. And for that, for that case, we want a U1 bundle that is non trivial on the S2, which forms uh, an SU2. On the other hand, when uh, when S1 is e equal to S2, uh, you get a trivial U1 bundle. So basically, the U1 bundle on these G variables will be trivial or non-trivial, depending on the S. And uh, the idea is such that when S1 is equal to S2, the U is well-defined, and then you know you will be working with a non-trivial bundle. Uh, on the other hand, when these are when this for the same patch, then you'll be then then it will only be removing one point and it's a compressible space. So you'll be working with a trivial bundle. 
So the U1 bundle will trivial and non trivial depending on the choice of S. And that, roughly speaking, how this app transmits the uh, information from the lower layers to the higher layer of the structure. And well, so this is a weird plaquette. But, well, so the, so the structure here is called a bundle term. The structure here is called a bundle term. Uh, basically, uh, formally, what a bundle term is, uh, you have some space S here, which is uh, G in our case. And uh, you have some fiber product of Y plus Y over S, and then you have some U1 bundle uh, over the fiber product Y plus Y over S. Basically, S would be like the let's say fixing this new x will be a variable here and the y cross i y fiber x will be the two links variable here and the u1 bundle will be what is still in the content here so that structure is called a bundle term however uh because this uh, y is on a linked variable we sort of want to be able to carry the multiplication structure of u onto these higher layers and that's why we need a multiplicative bundle term uh, Multiplicative bundle term uh, works in the following way. Well, the composition is not unique now because you don't know which type to end up on. But uh, how you transmit the information onto the higher layer is the following. If you draw like a pillow shape thing like that, where, where each, where you have a, you, you know what I'm drawing, right? You are drawing a pillow, pillow shape thing. Where the upper upper side is square, the lower side is square, and the middle side is four sides. Well, so you already know on, on these sides uh, what the U1 bundle should be, right? By by what I described here, you already know what the U1 bundle should be on those sides. So the requirement for the U1 bundle on these sides, which uh, depends on all the four S on the edges, is such that when you piece up this pillow shape thing, the total U1 bundle will be a trivial bundle. So that would define what the U1 bundle on this uh, on this square will be. Well, uh, more explicitly, it would be that if the S1 to S4, if, if all these S are are uh, are in this good patch, then it will be a trivial bundle. And when one of these S split to the other patch, it will be a non-trivial bundle. So that would be compatible with this uh, compatibility condition. So that uh, you you then you also know what the U1 bundle in this uh, square will be without knowing without being able to compose things in Y. So uh, that's a uh, sort of a multiplicative bundle term structure. Basically, it's uh, this structure with this extra requirement. Well, it doesn't have to be a square. Of course, it can be any thing, any shape, like a in in fact or something. Yeah. So this is a structure of multiplicative bundle term. Yeah, but from a concrete level, you're putting a, a D2 variable on each link and a D1 variable on each. Yes, yeah, sort of a vehicle, yeah. except sometimes you can only say one value when this is not the one. Yeah, and how, is that, um, I don't know, that sounds a little bit like this discontinuity or something. Right, that sounds, a, yeah, uh, the key is that uh, you control that, you sample the sort of all the possible. Like you sample, you purposefully do the discontinuity instead of encounter the discontinuity. That's well, let's say this like when we describe a fiber bundle. One way to describe a fiber bundle is to talk about the patches and talk about how things are related between the patches. And that way you sort of construct something that is continuous, even though the patches sound like discontinuity. Right. And uh right, so so actually the theme here is quite general. Uh the General theme here is that uh, the general theme here is that uh, Anna Founder. Uh, Anna Founder is basically yeah. I'll introduce what it is. But the theme is that Anna Founder is the is the suitable notion of Founder. It's the suitable notion of Founder for uh, topological spaces. Like you have some category where the objects are topological spaces and the maps are continuous maps. And in those cases, one should not use functors in general, one should use Anna functor. And Anna functor basically is doing what you just asked. You purposefully introduce some, I know, some patch or some other thing in the middle. So basically, an Anna functor is uh, this, a traditional functor. Uh, 
would be also these, these are two categories the objects and the morphisms. The traditional functors would be such a such map that satisfy certain conditions. Um, and another functor would be you purposefully introduce some, some category in the middle such that it's larger than C in the sense that the objects are subjective to C, but that the category is still equivalent to C. And then I uh, use the E to build uh, a functor to D. So in, in, in those, in the case of fiber bundle, for example, this would be like using some patch to cover it so that you purposefully introduce those seemingly discontinuities, but such that now you can talk about the relation between the different patches and so on. So uh, I think that this would be generally useful for, for uh, when, when you deal with things that are from topological case. Yeah, and these are all manifestations of these things. Thank mm -hmm. you. 